This week's guest is comedian, writer, and actor, Mr. Steve First. How are you, Steve? I'm all right, thank you. I'm good. That's good. Yeah, a confident answer. Well, yeah, it, in this profession and in this day and age, it can be a bit of a uh, an up and down roller coaster ride of confident and lacking in confidence. And even after all these years, never really goes away. And then just when you think you've got a job and you think you've nailed it, it's gone. And then you spend the next few days just thinking, this is just all shit. But, you know, I mean, that's just you know, it's just part of the course. And you do sort of get used to it. But then conversely, you never really get used to it, you know? Yeah. And it's very hard. I think what I've done is I've eliminated the, if I don't get work, I've eliminated the I'm taking it personally okay. uh, feeling. But it gets tiring. You know, you do go, oh, fuck, okay. I've just spent a long period uh, trying to get a job that I didn't get. But I'm actually quite glad I didn't get it. So, yeah. Anyway, so the, the very long way of saying I'm all right. You're good. good. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you. It's Easter weekend. Yeah. yeah, bank holiday. I know. It really makes much of a difference. For, you know, I mean, when you're married to somebody like I'm who, who has a proper job, you know, and they live for the weekend or live for the bank holiday, I'm like, it's yeah. like any other day, really. <laughs> you know, it's like any other day. <laughs> The the last time I saw you in person, not not you, you wouldn't have known I was there. It was you in the uh, garden. Yeah, it was a stalker situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I saw you as uh, Mr. Wormwood in Matilda. So that was a long time ago. That was a long I did time that ago. Ten years ago. Ten years ago. Well, I was trying to I was trying to work out how long ago it was. Earlier, I was like trying to look through 2012, photos. Two thousand twelve. Wow. And I remember, I mean, obviously I remember because because I was in it for a year and a half, but I, it was a um, it was the Olympic year. Okay. So it had a kind of that summer I, I joined uh, the original cast, but I wasn't in the original cast, if that makes any sense. They got they, they changed two people, including Paul Kay, who I took over from, who I love. And uh and the woman who played Miss Honey. But yeah, so, and then they changed the full cast that summer, just after the uh, the Olympics. So it all felt kind of just very woo uh, yeah. as a time anyway. Um, I bet like we, London was sort of buzzing at that sort of that time as well. Yeah, genuinely, know. and I was, you know, and, and I have to say, being in that show, having never done a musical before, I've done music, but I've never been in a in a proper, you know, all singing, all dancing show. Not that I do any dancing, but it was it was a proper like whoa. And I joined the week after the Olivier Awards when they won like more Olivier's than had ever been won before. It was like eight, yeah. And so it felt like oh wow, okay, this is literally the biggest show at the moment in the world. And yeah, so it was a, it was a quite a, a heady time. Yeah, that year. it was okay. a great year. Um, and uh, and still, yeah. So I was going to say, still, it'll be um, it's sort of unbeatable, I think, being in something that has that level of its own life. You know, yeah. just it, 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 it's almost bigger than than the sum of its parts. Absolutely, yeah. It, like I say, it was huge, wasn't it? That musical. I mean, like. Like Tim Minchin did an amazing job with it. And amazing job. Yeah. yeah. I, I like, you know, I was so excited to go down to London to see it, you know, and I'm not, I'm not a big theatre guy in general. It's like very rarely that I go and see something in the theatre, but it's like, uh, yeah, I, I, that was a must see for me. Like, I, you know, yeah. I to... it's weird. Cause I still, I, I, I've started teaching kids. There are these PQA academies, Pauline Quirk oh, academies. Yeah. They're like stagecoach, but they do, they also do film and TV stuff. They film short films and they do their own film festival and really well run. And they're sort of franchised as well. So people do pay to be on them. But, you know, so it's kids who are just obsessed by being actors. And, um, and genuinely always the thing that they're most impressed of. Because, of course, you know, they're all, they're all wanting to do musicals. 
yeah. is Matilda. I mean, they're all like, oh, you were Mr. Wormwood. Oh my God. You know, properly. Um, and you, you, even now, and I went back to see it. My wife hadn't seen it. And my friend who played my second wife in it went back in. And for six months, so I thought, oh, I've got to see it. And genuinely sitting there after 10 years and looking at it and going, this is still amazing. Because sometimes, you know, we can, phoning it in yeah. can be quite uh, the norm for cast number 20, please. You know, and it can feel a little bit, oh, Christ, just wading through treacle. But genuinely, like, we were blown away. Yeah, nice yeah. to see. So how did that happen? Like you say, it was your first sort of proper musical. Did you decide you wanted to go into that or was it offered to you? Or? No, it was a, it, um, it a cut. There's more. Thank you very much. She pay up, did she? Very well. All right. Okay. Um, excuse me. Someone just bought a bed. Uh, she's always doing deals. Um, uh, it, it was, I talked about, uh, with my agents are saying, well, I'd like to, yeah, I'd give it a go doing musical. That'd be fun. And then uh, this came up. So I already knew it was big. And I remember I bumped into Paul Kay at, at an audition and he was like, yeah, I did it. We're coming into London with it. I've just done it in Stratford. And I was like, oh, mate, I can't wait to see it. And so it was sort of there in my mind. I was thinking, I wonder if that's the sort of part I could do. Cause he's not, a, he's not a singer per se. No. I can sing, but not like a full, you know, West End Wendy voice. And I thought, well, it, yeah, that's, I could see myself doing that. And then sure enough, you know, but I, and I say this to all the kids as well when I teach that when you think you've done the worst you've ever done, and I genuinely thought it was an awful audition. I shat myself, not literally, but I was just nervous. So, and I walked in from the car and it was a late one. It was like seven o'clock in the evening because it was the only time the director could do. And I can hear the person singing my song, but really, you know, one of those sort of, and I was thinking, oh, just kind of that walk going, what, really? And sure enough, literally three days later, they just found there was no recall. It was like, as soon as you left the room, they all turned to each other and went, oh yeah, he's Mr. Wormwood. And I was like, well, that's, you know, so, I think it was because I had no expectation that, yeah. that that sort of thing can come along. And then I did Made in Dagenham as a big musical as the original cast of that. And it wasn't quite as, there were some fantastic songs, but you know, another experience. And um, I, I'm now sort of hankering to go back in to one. I've got that, you know, it's been a while since I've done a long one and uh I'm a different person now. And I think, I, you know, you have to be match fit as well. That's the other thing. And I'm okay. really not match fit at the moment. I'm like, I went up for a musical audition last week. I was like, <gasps> yeah, eight shows a week. I was, I was going to say, it was like 300 shows of Matilda you did, wasn't it? 650. 650. I mean, not obviously all at once concurrently, but <laughs> yeah, you must have a bit tired. of a rest. Yeah, <laughs> fuck me. It's like, um, although it does feel like it because he just, Although, oh, well, there's only work in the evenings, but yeah, but because other kids are coming in and out of it, you've got to really, you've got to keep going back to doing tech rehearsals for, oh, God, who are these pricks coming in now? And of course, oh, yeah, these are the real, these are the talent that are coming in. And you've, uh, you've got to replot it for them, you know, and you've got yeah. to put the smile on your face. And of course, for them, if, you know, if you you were excited, oh, my God, can you imagine how excited an 11 year old's going to be being in that show? So it's very infectious, but it's very tiring because you're constantly uh, bringing the next lot in, and so it doesn't really doesn't really stop. Yeah, um, it's not like a like a stand up routine where you just go and you do your hour every night or whatever. Exactly. It's constantly other people that have got to. Well, I used to think because the, the the part of Mr. Wormer comes out at the beginning of the second act and he just chats to the audience, and because I'd done so much comparing over the years, my natural habitat. It's just having a chat, you know, yeah. you know what it's like. You're comic. You just go, if someone's wearing a ridiculous outfit or that, and also because they were so close to us, it was really different. And literally, I think three weeks in, just told no, in no uncertain terms. No. You can't Stick. work the crowd. <laughs> no, not at all. I call you occasion if something happens, you can, but, but generally, no, really, they're really, really, you know. 
And that's the thing I thought, oh, that'll be good because that kind of lightened the, the load a little bit. I yeah. look forward to that bit. But no, they were like, nope, keep to the script. It's nice to be in a place where they still advertise things like the Dinosaur Adventure Park, it's time you came and saw us. That's humour. That's the humour of Great Yarmouth. Let's talk about some of your characters, if that's yeah. all right. Yeah. One of my personal favourites, I know it's one of your bigger characters, is uh, Mr Lenny Beige. Yeah. Who's sort of like a Jewish all-round entertainer, sort of singer, cabaret. Yeah. Where, where did he come from? He was born out of years ago. I did a... Myself and my best mate, Mike, who we were at school with and then at college with, and then went into business together. We ran a comedy magazine called The Heckler Magazine back in 1990. with was Britain's first comedy magazine. We published for a year, made nothing out of it. It was a labor of love. And um, that got me into doing stand up as well because we were promoting together a, a, a comedy club in North London. And then we started, again, collectors of just shit, of going to car boot sales and going, what the fuck? It's got a wall of games, of old board games. What are we going to do? Let's do a nightclub with board games. So we did. And then that became really successful. But again, the worst business model ever, because people would come in, they'd pay five quid to come in, and they'd stay all night. The bar would do brilliantly. But we're like, there's no turnover of punters. It's like they come in, and then they will pay play risk for three hours or whatever. So um, the music we were playing them started to be easy listening, which then became part of that easy listening revival of the mid nineties. And uh, we were we were we were doing this club in in this in a friend's amazing venue in Mayfair in town. They said we've got we're getting our own venue because they were part of a group. And they said we're getting our own venue. We'd like to give you the Friday night. It's just off Regent Street. It's like a it's a smallish bar with a you know. It's, got, it's quite glitzy, mirrored, you know, it's very 1980s. And we're like, oh, okay, they're giving us a Friday night. Let's do a cabaret night, but let's invent the character to, you know, so it was always going to be, I'm going to do a character that I want, you know, that you'd see in movies when people would go in and they'd have a supper cabaret club. Those, that was the image. Yeah. So Lenny was sort of born out of that. And, um, <sighs> And, you know, uh, we had a lot of success very quickly because we moved from there to an incredible venue called the Talk of London that no one was using. It was used. It was in the same building that Cats was in. Oh, so right. Cats, big theatre, New London theatre there. And underneath it, because it was built on a concrete cylinder, um, so it had a rotating stage. So underneath it, they built a purpose-built cabaret venue. And this was in the 60s and 70s. And the only show that was on there was this tribute to the musicals for confused tourists. So they'd be bust in from a Heathrow, like you know, just a lot of Japanese tourists, like jet lagged, going, oh. they've just checked into the hotel. Then they go to this show and it was like, you'd see 10 musicals in one show with a house band and eat awful food. And we walked into this venue and went, this is the best venue we've ever seen. We didn't even know it was here. Yeah. And the bloke who ran it, Ray McIntyre, he was like, yeah, yeah. Oh, what you're doing sounds fun, yeah. Yeah, right, well, yeah, we'll give you a, give you a Sunday night. And like, a Sunday night, all right. So we did a season, like five shows, did really well. And then uh, he gave us a Wednesday. And it sort of snowballed really quickly because my then musical director was Guy Chambers, who didn't, he was a sort of penniless musician then. And then he, he said to me, oh, I've got... Uh, I've got a meeting with Robbie Williams and they did their first, you know, their first meeting, they wrote angels and a couple of other songs. And Rob used to come, he became a very good friend of, of mine in the clubs and he came down and would sing. And then it, but then as he became big, like stratospheric big, yeah. the club got written about Lenny got pulled into that whole uh, dragnet of just madness of, you know, this is like mid to late nineties. It was crazy time. And, even the time of uh, New Labour, and I stood for Parliament as Lenny in Wandsworth. I got 101 votes, and no policies. <sighs> and I mean, just just an extraordinary few years. Did a lot of TV appearances, and really thought, "Wow, this is it. This is it. It's going to be." 
and it never quite it was the almost it was the almost ran and now when i look back on it there's many reasons and a lot of things weren't quite in alignment and i had a crazy writer that was just on a course to, to, to somewhere else and um but i owe him a huge debt you know in terms of the, the, his, the way he changed my language and stuff and so it, it, there were a lot of things that were right about it and a lot of things that I didn't take it seriously enough at the time and also I didn't have management that really I wasn't with an Avalon or an off the curb or someone that was really shaping my career yeah I had a manager who's long since gone sadly but he he really believed in me but he, he I really he only had me and a couple of other people but so I sort of felt that I missed out on stuff and but I've digitized a lot of old appearances and stuff now. When I look back on it, you know, I'm very, I'm still, I'm still doing Lenny. I'm still very fond of him and I'm taking yeah. him to America for the first time. I'm going to, I've got a gig in LA in June oh, wow. at a cabaret venue with a friend of mine who used to play bass in my band, who's now a really successful film com and TV composer in LA. And I talked to him yesterday and he's like, mate, do you want me to put a band together? I'm like, yeah. He went, Fuck, absolutely. Because I'm going to play bass and it's going to be, you know, and I, it's like, we're only, you know, I'm only doing like a 70 minute show. But um, so very fond of Lenny and yeah. he's been with me for so long. And even during lockdown, when I was doing broadcasts as Lenny, it, it felt like he's sort of constantly adapting and, and I'm doing the best stuff as Lenny now that I've ever done. I'll do a Tom White show. I do a Neil Diamond show um, and do improv shows and do you know, whatever. It's like he's allowed me to still um, exercise those cabaret muscles that, yeah. you know. Like the improvisation. Yeah, love it. I mean, absolutely love it. And uh, he still stands you know completely separate to everything i do because it's and it's like living with another person because i mean it's nearly 30 years i've been doing that 94 wow. was the first time so it's a long time and i'm a much better singer than i was then you know too many too much of everything and i've got a very sensitive voice and you know i learned i know from doing a longer thing you need to warm it up and warm it down and look after it and don't go out and shout afterwards and try not to you know smoke yeah. and try all of that shit you know, like, you know when you're a kid you know, like your musical experience has made like yeah. lenny a better character in that way like the, the skills you wouldn't have had in 94 when you first started doing him, when he was just a big pair of eyebrows. Absolutely, yeah. Where well, you're just like, I paint my face. <laughs> and in fact, my wife went, you need to take that look of Lenny out because if you're putting that on a promo for America, they're going to think you're blacking up. And I looked at it and she's right. It, the tan was so intense. I mean, so intense that if you didn't know and you just saw that, it would look very, very wrong. And uh, obviously the more mature I got, the more it toned down. It yeah. was so ridiculously over the top as a cartoon. And, and it's been really nice looking. And also we did two series of this variety pack for the Beeb that partner was in and Matt and Matt Lucas was my script editor and Matt and Dave were in it. And, and um, it, it's really good. Yeah. And we made it for 30 grand a show, which was sort of unheard of because we had the venue anyway and because the band were friends and, you know, we cut corners, but it because everything was fully formed already. It was just film what we've been doing for three, four years. And actually, when you look back at it, you know, actually, this was a really good show. And I've always had that desire to do another show like that where Lenny is host because, and it's not, it, it, it's not just about, Lenny and all my ego, but it's like there's so many people I've worked with still that are world class, not just great, but world class that are still not really known for various reasons. And you're like, you know, whether they're in the jazz world or whether they're, um, you know, someone like David McCalmont, who's one of the greatest singers I've ever heard, um, you know, he's had a lot of success over the years, but he's still not, you know, he would struggle to sell a big venue himself. And yet he's as good as anybody I've ever worked with and or seen. 
And yet, so you, you know, I've got that thing of it, it's like Lenny could still be the kind of ringmaster in a in a in a circus of less freaky people, but more, you know, just genuinely quality people. Because shit, some of the acts we had, it wouldn't get you. You couldn't even write the names down without people <laughs> being offended. I mean, genuinely, you know, like Spanky Body Shakespeare, nah. And he contacts me every so often. I'd like to do. You're still doing any stuff, Steve? I'd love to. Uh, like, nah. No, Spanky Botty Shakespeare is it is man it brought woman on to stage quoting so sonnets whilst slapping the woman's ass. I mean, that was it. It was <laughs> quite unbelievable. And um, you know, with loop music playing in the background. Brilliant. I mean, brilliant. Did uh, the first series of Britain's Got Talent and got booed off after about five seconds. Um, there's no justice in the world there's no justice there isn't i mean it's no no taste in the ah. world but yeah so it's um uh, it's a funny you know it's i'm very very fond of that and i but i still it's not like oh i think it's over it's had his day it's yeah. I'm, I'm genuinely you know i still love getting on stage as lenny and and uh, you know that thing of singing tom Waits songs now opened up that world of tom Waits music which previously you know, I wasn't really very well acquainted with. So I'm very grateful, uh, you know, for that. And also it suits my voice now as well. So I love, you know, I love that. Love still yeah. feeling passionate about it. I may be dressed as a clown, but push me and I will strike you. One of the things I, I remember, and this is going further back than uh, Matilda. One of the things I remember seeing you pop up on, and I don't know why it stuck with me, but it really has, was um, you playing Ronald McDonald on uh, Marcus Briggs' Ducks sort of late nights. We did a thing called the late edition. That was in 2006, maybe. Whoa. We did about 2000, between 2006 yeah. and 2000, 2007, maybe 2009. We initially, we did it for BBC Four. And it was like the late edition. So Marcus was host and I would, we was brought in to do all the characters. And we did it initially on the radio for a couple of apps. And it was all, it was, everyone was very happy. Bill Dare was producing, he did the Now Show and other stuff. And it was, Marcus, I, I knew anyway, he was a brilliant stand up and, and a, just fantastic at doing topical yeah. stuff. Great writers. And, um, then it went live, which was really exciting. We were genuine, you know, we were like, so that if I was doing two characters, you know, it was like, I've got 12 minutes to get out of that into another one and then do the live link up and make it look like it. So it was, you know, it was like, this is genuinely exciting live TV. And we were desperate for it to get a BBC Two repeat, but they got, according to their the BBC Two, well, because we've got, um, uh, What's the uh, the long running Friday night panel show? Oh, uh, have I got news for you? No, the one no. on BBC Two. Um, the one with stand ups on it. Uh, mock forever. the week. There you go, mock the week. Because we got mock the week. We don't think we can have another topical show. We like it's got nothing like mock the week except it's slightly topical. Um, and they were like, no, we don't know. We don't really want to. I mean, you're like, no, it doesn't even have to be on the same night but they were really reticent about it not having a repeat. So consequently, you, you have a window, really, to, to repeat a topical show, otherwise it's pointless. Yeah, it's not topical. And they went, no. And, and after a while, Marcus went, I can't keep doing this for no audience. It's just too, too much work and too debilitating. But some of the characters in it were great. And, you know, like that, and that McDonald sketch is a, a, an absolute doozy. It's it really a, stuck with me. It's like, like, isn't that a bit sinister? You're like, I'm a clown who feeds fattening food to children. I wrote the book on <laughs> sinister. I know, beautifully so written. And um, not by me, I should say. <laughs> but it was that thing of, and that was, you know, when you get, uh, it was it was like being part of a little, and, you know, it's the closest thing I think I've come to being part of a troop of something on telly where, you know, every week is different. You know, when you know, the stories of Saturday Night Live at night. Yeah. And they don't really know until the day before what's going to fly and what's, what news is going to stick and, and all of that. And so it had its own energy. 
that was great. And it was the, at the time, that, you know, it was at the Beeb. So working at the BBC was still, you know, was, was working at the BBC. And I did a lot of work there over 10 years, much more so than any other institution. And, and yeah, loved that show and um, genuinely was proud of it. And it's a real shame when, and, you know, when I've done show reels and I've looked at stuff and I've gotten, I've looked back at them and I've got, God, it allowed me to do that and that and that and that. And you don't even have a chance to kind of work something up. You're just thrown in the deep end and do it. And love that. Love yeah. that. And uh, otherwise, I think too much and ruminate too much on stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm creating new characters at the moment for a new show. And I'm very happy with them. But, you know, it, it, there's a long process of getting it in front of an audience. Whereas that was great because you just, yeah. here's a funny, here's a script. Think you got a voice for that? And then you'd meet with the makeup and hair and you go, have we got to look for it? Yeah. I see, you know, I love all the, just gluing it together really quickly. And, um, you know, when you play them back to back, you know, like, Oh, actually, God, we did an awful lot. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I miss, miss that doing that sort of thing, but you know, I'm an old man now. No one, no one needs this you know, in their life every week. Because uh, speaking of old men, a uh, friend of the show, Alex Lowe, was on there as oh. well as Barry from Watford. And no. some, again, some of those sketches, I've, you know, I've seen Alex do so much Barry over the years, but there's still some of the sketches from the late edition that stick in my mind. Yeah. Him yeah. wandering around a shopping centre, talking to the youth and everything. Oh, I love that character. I'm so fond of that. I mean, I'm a big Clinton fan, but there's something yeah. about it was Barry. It's got his ability, his vocal ability is just because he's got that high pitch thing to his voice. So when you go, it's just, oh, I love, love that character. I think one of my favorite ever characters. Anytime I do an old man voice, it's very hard not to do Barry. Yeah, really hard. Yeah, it's called cornered, cornered the market. <laughs> It might say Mayor of London on his business card, but no, it is. It might as well say Mayor of fucking Trumpton. And uh, like you say, you're working, <clears throat> you've been doing some uh, work in progress shows of yep. different live characters recently. Yeah. Yeah. So, and any, uh, who, who are we looking at? Any, any interesting characters coming out? Well, I did a show uh, a few years ago of five characters, uh, sort of five. I've arrived at five. The, this character Queenie, the mayor of Kentish Town, who I know you know, and um, then there's Dave Pike, former stump man who's killed most people he's worked with, and <laughs> who now teaches children. And is he modelled on uh, Robin Asquith? Because his look is very Robin. No, Asquith. but it's that. And the weird thing is, I try. I nearly. I was. I was trying to get a pet camera out, but I was driving a few weeks ago in the motorway and there was a bloke who had his own car on a trailer stunt driver and it was the font and the look and everything and I was fucking I was trying, you know one of those trying to go off didn't manage it but um there's just a look of certain people and I think well, Asquith is absolutely you know you've hit the nail on the head with you know it's a it, He's got leather, and he talks about his leather blues on. You know, it's a blues on. It's not a jacket. It's a blues on. You know, it's like a, it, it's a semi. It's like a jacket, but more like a blouse, and uh, cowboy boots and a belt buckle. And I'm a very I, the minutiae what people wear. I've always been obsessed by, it. and um, at the risk of almost getting me beaten up on many occasions. That thing of staring too much, of going, oh, making the mental note like the RoboCop. <laughs> But the, um, so those are the ones, and then Ernie Vaz is probably my favorite, who's the, who owns a waltzer, uh, you know, and, and he ain't allowed, to, you know, the waltzers now because he's been impounded, you know, because a young boy was thrown from one of the cars and broke his femur. But he's, and he's, he's an old school and he hates theme parks because, you know, it's really come to something when the people running the fun fairs are having more fun than the pump. It's that he doesn't understand the concept of, you know, being, shortchanged and he, he loves that that the misery of a of a fun fair which is what i grew up with but the new characters i wanted to, so i had five that was an hour of stuff and i don't leave the stage when i get changed into these characters 
And then I thought, well, I want to do new ones that I'd sort of created a couple during lockdown. One was a, a, a druid who is a freelance corporate troubleshooter as well, but using ancient, you know, druidy stuff to, to, to solve major corporate problems out. And then there was um, uh, a sadistic geography teacher. Again, we've all had them. And... Um, they're they're all quite different they're all um i think they're all ready now you know when you kind of keep changing them and keep kind yeah. of you know I, I i can spend too long kind of uh pouring over the minutiae of everything and you've got to go no these are them now i need to take them out and keep doing them where they sort of land you know you know what it's like yeah but for characters it's it's different from stand-up because you sort of have to be quite rigid with the script. Um, there's a style guru who's my 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 free thinking one, which I like the mayor, which I can kind of talk to the audience with. He's much more. I'm going to take, I'm going to disseminate what you're wearing and talk about that. That allows me that freedom to kind of feel the the audience a bit. Yeah. And then you know the others are more rigid. Um, and then there's one who was a former royal butler who uh, was engaged in these awful nefarious wrongdoings because everyone is, they were all at it. All the, all the butlers in all the royal households, basically since George the first time have been trying to nick stuff, have been dressing up in underwear, have been, so he's part of that. And um, yeah, they're quite dark. I, I like dark. And so yeah. what I've got now is I've got two hours, I've got 10 characters and I'm going to go out on the road and do smaller theatres, but doing, and I've never seen anyone do, you know, do the, the full two hours by themselves, but with 10 characters. So, and I, and the music in between I've done as well. So, oh, wow. and, you know, so all of that I've, it's, you know, I, I've created this thing. So fingers crossed, um, I, I, I will have the stamina to do it. So I'm just booking little pockets of gigs at the moment. So I've got Northwest tour in October and then I've got, you know, down South in July, August. And, you know, uh, just, just thinking, fuck it. If I don't do it, I haven't got a promoter. I'm just going to do it myself. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's, uh, yeah. And going into weird places, a lot of places that I've had to get Google maps out and go, not only have I never heard of it, I had no idea where it was and, or if indeed it is a place rather than a skin complaint <laughs> and, you know, Bungay, Bungay, Suffolk, no idea. Uh, but it has a very lovely 150 seat theater. And that's so, you know, I'm quite excited about just getting in the car and taking my, taking my humble show to the people. Just, just, just to the little people, um, but yeah. So it's uh, it, it's going to be uh, an interesting an interesting one doing two hours of it. Fuck, I think I'm mental. <laughs> and uh, where can people keep up with you if they want to find out about these shows? Where's the best way to uh... stevefirst.com? Stevefirst, easy. Stevefirst.com, easy. I know because there was also there was another. St you see, I'm. Officially, Stephen with a PH and an F U R S T. Okay. When I grew up and we got into Animal House, the film, you know, that name comes up as Stephen first. And I'm like, so he was the big guy. He was, he was Bluto. He was the, 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 the one that was bullied, not yeah. Bluto. That was a blue character. The, um, uh, the fat guy, uh, Flounder. And uh, and then he went on to be in one of the Star Treks and then he went, you know, Babylon 5. So he was quite a successful uh, American uh, character actor. And and I thought he's got to have, you know, because he was, as people called him Steve, so he's got to have that as a website. And he never, he never did. So um, I got in there and then he died. So not that I killed him. Not for, I didn't kill him for a website. That would be it's a bit, really bit of an overreaction. quite extreme. Yeah, I want coffee.com, coffee.org, coffee. Uh, so um, I've, uh, yeah, anyway, stevefirst.com. And uh, and I, I'm reasonably good about updating. And I've got two YouTube channels as well, which are th you can do through the website. But I've got yeah, a, a Steve First one with all well. the, thank you. And then there's the, uh, the Lenny one. And I've digitized all the 
Lenny Beige variety packs, and I will be putting them up at the risk of getting them taken down. But I'm going to, you know, there's some great shows. Yeah. And, you know, me duetting the floral dance with Terry Wogan, me playing bassoon, um, and Wogan going, I never rehearse. I'm not rehearsing. And what happened? You fucked it up. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but made me look like I'd fucked it up. So, you know, you've got a kind of... That's what people cap, want, isn't it? Yeah. It's the sheer professionalism of you think, oh, I fucked up. No, you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's not, you know, nice revisiting all of that and and, uh, and and sort of keeping the archive going a little bit as well. Right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you ever so much for Thank talking you. to me. I've really enjoyed it. Real pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Well done. Love your stuff. And I think it's, uh, uh, you know, always, I love these sort of things. And I think, you know, well done for, for, um, for your passion and, uh, and enthusiasm and uh, yeah. And, and ability. Polish yourself, Mark.